So Bono, famed musician, veteran maverick, social activist, recently said in an interview that he believed all problems of the world were basically problems of the human spirit. And all problems of the human spirit were really problems of the human heart. And I couldn't agree more. Take any of the defining challenges of our time, any of them, and distill them to their core, to their foundation, and you will see that each one is a mirror of an impoverished heart. The economic crisis, what is that in essence if the inability of countries, of communities, to balance equity with acquisition? Climate change, what is that in essence if not our inability to live in communion with nature, with each other, with the earth? Mental health decline, the healthcare crisis, what is that in essence, but if not our ability to find harmony, union between psyche and soma? Our war on terrorism, our inability to get along with others of different cultures, faiths, countries, what is that if not a reflection of our inability to get along with others in our home? So every social, economic, political crisis at its core speaks to a deep schism, a deep disconnect between human and our heart. I will take his statement one step further to say that the problems of the world really lie in the conflict between the human heart and the mind. Because I believe that the heart is so willing and ready to engage in a dialogue of consciousness, of union, of transcendence and transformation. But it is this mind, you see, this ego-driven, obsessive mind that seeks to acquire at all costs, that seeks dominance and control and power over the other at all costs. The acquisitive mind, you see, not the inquisitive one, that obscures the radiance of our heart. Growing up in India, I was bejeweled by stories of ancient texts, one of which is the definitive text of Eastern spirituality and mysticism, the Bhagavad Gita. This story takes place on a battlefield and speaks of a family torn asunder. It speaks of two sides, stepbrothers caught in a clash of good versus evil, of light versus shadow. And this story is set in a purposeful way to symbolize that one archetype of the fatherhead, the figurehead, the leader, has the potential to burst forth, to carry forth in the same gene pool, the same DNA, the potential capacities for creation and destruction, yin and yang, the infinite dualities of our existence, speaking to the fact that each one of us here today and in infinity holds this power within us. And it is up to our singular moment-to-moment -moment decision making capacity to, to honor which capacity will burst forth in the world, the capacity for creation or destruction. So let me invite you back to ancient India and let's walk on this battlefield, let's be witnesses to the scene that was unfolding oh so long ago. Dusty, ancient India. The battle lines were drawn. The two sides faced each other. The tension was palpable, cut the air like a knife. Apprehension everywhere, blood against blood, brother against blood, brother. Each one firmly convinced that the evil doer was the other, the external. The birds of prey circled up above, greedily, hungrily anticipating what was sure to be rotting flesh littering the battlefield below. Everyone on that battlefield was convinced that this was a war that indeed needed to be fought. There wasn't much doubt anywhere. There was clarity of purpose born out of a delusion that I was right and good, but the other across the enemy lines was the evil one, to be annihilated at all costs. The belief was so deep-seated, the rise of righteousness so powerful, that there was no doubt in anyone's mind that in order for victory of the self to be attained, the other must be destroyed at any cost. 
Almost sounds like divorce court, I know. <laughs> or just another day on Wall Street. When we hear of stories of ancient times, of battles war won and lost, senseless acts committed in the name of religion or pride or brotherhood, Stalin or Hitler, Saddam, we wonder what, what, what does that have to do with us civilized selves? Surely we won't take to spear an arrow and leave our countrymen languishing in the village square. We don't burn at the stake anymore. We are much more civilized. But here today, I ask you to examine whether this is true. Sure, our weapons of destruction have changed. No more a spear, a bow, an arrow. Now we have drones and missiles. The weapons certainly have changed form, but our state of mind remains as primitive. I ask you, in the quietude of this room, the quietude of your inner being, your soul, to ask yourselves, how different really is your mind from that of your ancestors? For when you are cheated upon, betrayed, hurt or wounded, how different are you then? How high, forceful, Loud will your ego, ego clangor for redemption. How different are you really from your ancestors? When your children dare to cross your path, when they dare to believe in another God, when they dare to marry someone they shouldn't, according to you, when they dare to speak up to you in defiance, how will your ego respond? Will it respond like those men on the battlefield in India in the ancient times, ready to avenge, to seek control, power, and dominance over the other, just to feel the certainty of self? The mind you see, our primitive mind, remains emotionally trapped in time. It is the same mind that was with those men on the battlefield, fighting brother against brother. The same mind that dared to stop Malala, the same mind that had the audacity to think of going to the west coast of Africa and tear siblings from mothers and bring them across the Americas so long ago. It is the same mind that the parent holds true within them when they say they are going to discipline their child in the name of love. The same mind that handles the bitter divorce settlement. The same mind behind the education system that allows a child who learns differently to feel lesser than. The same mind that allows a child who thinks differently to feel smaller than. The same mind who allows children who look differently to feel uglier than. You see, the mind hasn't really evolved much. President Obama said that in one of his speeches, that the defining challenges of our time were climate change, the economic crisis, our war on terror. I humbly disagree. I believe the defining challenge of our time is a true witnessing of our utter spiritual devolution, our emotional paucity, our emotional impoverishment that doesn't allow us to contemplate how to work with the us, to reduce the self-interest of the ego and find changes that matter to all of us. So let's go back to that battlefield for a moment when I said that everyone was clear. Everyone was clear in their purpose, I lied. That was just for dramatic effect. There had to be one dissenter, out of which came the entire Bhagavad Gita, the entire spiritual force of Indian mysticism. There was one, one lone charioter who had doubt, who simply couldn't contemplate how he was being asked to fight against his blood. He just couldn't understand it. He just couldn't see how the others could be so certain, so in the egoic mind for power, without doubt. Yet, he couldn't act out of his heart either. He was trapped in the conflict between heart and mind. And his answers came in the form of Krishna, his higher self, if you will, the God form, who took the, the, the role of his charioter and symbolically and literally took him from darkness into light. Krishna taught him that every external conflict we have in our lives, be it with our children, our spouses, with the economy, with nature, every external conflict is but 
a manifestation of the internal ambivalence. There is no external conflict that doesn't exist on the internal level. And unless we realize that all of life is a mirror to our internal landscape, we will miss the lessons entirely. And then Krishna whispered to him and said, and you know how your ego of your fellow brothers is getting caught up in the power and dominance that they believe they will extract from the subjugation of the other. That is a delusion of madness indeed. Do not get trapped in that. And finally, Krishna said, this duality of good and evil that you are so caught in the midst of, that you are so trapped looking for answers, this is also an illusion. For good and bad exist together, complementing in the harmonious unification of the whole. And in fact, the good exists so that the bad, the bad exists so that the good can be propelled forth to take us to a higher equation of living, of union and transcendence. The signs are clear. I don't know why we're waiting any longer. A tsunami in Japan, previously in Asia, 230,000 people being wiped out within 30 minutes. A 16-minute tornado in Oklahoma. A lone gun man taking AK-47s into a school in Connecticut and committing sacrilege. A group of six lone lost souls taking weapons of destruction into a hotel in Bombay and committing carnage. How many more signs do we need of our emotional schism, of the divorce between heart and mind, of our emotional impoverishment? But this is not only happening on the macro level. Let's not be fooled. It is happening in the micro, in kitchens and bedrooms across the world in the soft neglect of the mother who's too preoccupied, you see, to notice that her daughter's homework page was smudged with dry tears. Or the quick slip of the father who didn't realize, but before he knew it, he called his son a disgrace, but he didn't mean it. Or the anguished self-hatred of the preteen who's so longing to fit in in a world that she doesn't understand, spends half her time over a toilet bowl purging. And what about the painful insecurities of the schoolyard bully who everyone has castigated. But if only we realize that it is the bully who is consumed with insecurities and who longs for a vessel to purge, to feel control. The time to create the Krishnas to our children's last Arjunas is here. The time to become their charioters, taking them from darkness to light is here, in the micro level, in the moment, in the here and now, between you and you and your higher self and all those around you. The greatest political act you can do today is to go home and write a love song to your children. The greatest act of redemption you can do for the planet today is to go home and enter the embrace of your children's arms with a different consciousness, no longer seeking to dominate and subjugate, but instead changing the dynamics, changing the hierarchy, and allowing your children to take the lead, for they are the masters of the present moment like no other. It is time today to really listen to each other, not to listen with an agenda, but to listen with an open spontaneity, curious of the next moment, willing to suspend the ego for the sake of knowledge and wisdom. I ask you to take this moment today, in the here and now, to define the next decade. For the consciousness of the next decade doesn't happen in the next 10 years. It happens now. The seeds lie here. Possibly the seeds to end world hunger just got sparked. Possibly the next Facebook just got invented. Possibly the cure to our mindless violence just got inspired. The key to the consciousness of the next decade is in the here and now. It is in how we parent our children, how we go home today embodying a different consciousness. So let the, war, the next war we fight not be on the physical realm any, anymore, but instead be to break down the walls and barriers that hide your inner giant. And let the next victory be the extent to which you succeed 
in breaking down the barriers of your neighbor's inner giant. Our inner giant is stirring. For some, the wake-up call may be louder and ruder. It's directly proportionate to the deeper the slumber. For some, the wake-up call may be a cancer, a loss of job, an economic crisis, a divorce. But regardless, let's not wait any longer to stir the giant. The giant is ready. It lies within you. You are sitting on the chariot of change. I invite you to answer the call. Thank you.